I am arguing for disinflation and a slowdown in growth, which should re lead to a negative nominal print for Q2 and Q3 and Q4 of this year, a, a, a NBER official recession um, and a significant fall in the averages. Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart. Are you scratching your head at the disconnect between the macro data and current market prices? Are you flummoxed by how the markets can be performing so well so far this year when so many indicators are at recessionary levels? Is determining how to allocate your portfolio in the midst of these contradictions making your head hurt? If you answered yes to any of these, you'll be glad to hear that money manager Michael Pinto is returning to the program today. Always one to bring clarity to the picture with logic and data, he'll share his latest macro and market outlooks while explaining his method for arriving at them. Michael, thanks so much for joining us today. So great to be back with you, Adam. <laughs> oh, Michael, you are one of our perennially most requested guests on this channel. A lot of people are very excited that you're able to come back and join us this week. We got an awful lot to talk about. Let's just dive right in. Let's start with a question I like to ask you at the beginning of all of these discussions. What's your current assessment of the global economy and financial markets? Well, first of all, I'd like to say that you know your audience has this visceral knowledge that things are not normal. And what I'm going to try to do today is explain what that not normal feeling is, put some data behind it. And then talk a little bit more about my model. So let's just talk about the situation today. We had, without a doubt, the greatest distortion of interest rates and money supply growth in history. That, that is a fact. And I'm going to go into the data again with all of these hypotheses. That engendered a triumvirate of asset bubbles in stocks, in bonds, and in real estate. The greatest bubble. All three existing concurrently in history. And again, I'm not being hyperbolic. I'm going to put data behind what I just said. And that led to, you know, when you make money free and distort asset prices and distort money supply and distort borrowing costs, that led to the most over leveraged global economy in history, which of course led to record inflation, 40 year high inflation in the developed world all existing concurrently. And if you actually count inflation accurately, it was the greatest bout with inflation in the developed world concurrently in history. And that forced central banks to undergo a course of unprecedented monetary tightening. Again, all of this is going to be given with data and facts, not just my opinion. <laughs> so then I'm going to talk about what is holding the crash in abeyance for now? And what my IDEC, inflation, deflation, the economic cycle model says about what is happening next. What's the predictive algorithm saying where we're headed in the very near future? All right, great. Well, look, um, you were on this program in 2021, warning about the greatest monetary and fiscal spending cliff in history, <laughs> which we got. <laughs> and 2022 happened and, and definitely you know, the market sold off pretty hard that year. Um, as you said, sort of the crash is being held in abeyance right now, at least for the time being, we'll find out. Um, but I do want to give you props for having sort of, you've been tracking the story well so far. So uh, how do you want to dive into the macro story here? I got a bunch of questions for you about, you know, a lot of current topics, the debt ceiling, what's happening right now with inflation, what the Fed's likely to do next, where liquidity truly lies here, what kind of recession odds are there? How's the best way to jump into your description of where we are? So let me just go through what I just promised I would go through. Okay. So let's just talk about the, the money supply increase and interest rate manipulation, because again, this is going to tell us why we have a problem. What, what led to the crash in 22? Why is the S&P 500 still down 15%? Why is the NASDAQ still down 18%? And then we're going to talk about why it's not crashed yet and what I see happening and when that crash is going to happen. So let's, let's just take it step by step. We have about an hour, as you said. So let's slowly walk through this. This isn't, 
You know, <laughs> what, one of the things I love about wealthy and it's not sound by TV, you know, it's not like, you know, we, that's not a 200 day moving average television show or how I feel, uh, you know, growth versus value. This is about data and math. So let's go through the, let's go through some numbers. So in the U S there was an 8.2 trillion dollar increase in the base money supply from 800 billion dollars in the start of the global financial crisis to nine trillion dollars in the base money supply or the fed's balance sheet now what what is the base money supply they call it there's another name for that by the way it's called high powered money why do they call it that because it's the basis it's it's actually notes and coins in circulation and bank credit or fed credit which is the building blocks of all loans in a fiat monetary system. So it's very important to understand that you go from $800 billion to $9 trillion since the global financial crisis, you, you, you create a, a tremendous amount of latent potential to build broader monetary aggregates and inflation. Then you had near 0% nominal borrowing costs for 10 of the last 14 years. So they were below 1%, around 0% for 10 of the last 14 years. That's the United States. But this phenomenon, by the way, Adam, was global in nature. Global central bank balance sheets were 8% of GDP prior to 2000. Well, why, why 2000? Well, that's before we, we embarked on this grand experiment with zero borrowing costs. You know, in 2000 and the crash of NASDAQ in 2000, we took interest rates to 1%. And we raised them back to five and a quarter, 6% before the collapse of the, the housing bubble. Uh, and then we went to 0%. So two, it was 8% of GDP in the year 2000. They are now 47% of GDP. Wow. Central bank balance sheets. Now you talk so about from eight percent twenty years ago is, to forty seven percent. This now. is not. I'm not talking about a nominal. I'm sorry. I'm just saying, I'm repeating. It went from eight percent about twenty years ago to forty seven percent now. Of GDP, I'm not of talking GDP. about the increase in the balance sheet. I'm talking about right, this right, percent right. of the underlying economy. That should, that should just like tell you how this. When I say the greatest distortion in money supply growth, base money supply growth, high powered money in history, that's that's a fact, that, that's, that's an unde, undeniable fact. And what did all that money supply do? It engendered um, the greatest asset bubbles in, in stocks, bonds, and real estate. So let's just talk about the equity bubble, first of all. In, in At the end of 2021, start of 2022, the total market cap of equities, which is the valuation of equities as a percentage of the underlying economy, hit 200%, 200%. If you go back to the global financial crisis, which is when you know people always say, well, there's no more leverage in the economy. You know, <laughs> Everything's normal. There's no great distortions out there. Banks are overcapitalized, blah, 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 except when they go out of business, uh, four of them so far. So it, before that, it was 105% before the start of the global financial crisis. So we, we doubled the total market cap of equities as a percentage of GDP. I'm sorry, as a percent, yeah, as a percentage of GDP doubled since the global financial crisis, which is before the, the global financial system melted down. Now, let's talk about the bond bubble. Was there a bond bubble? I wrote a book about it in 2013 called <laughs> The Coming Bond Market Collapse. I, I mean, it was a predictive book. It wasn't supposed to happen the, 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 the day after it was published. <laughs> we've had this collapse of the, of the bond market. Now, Here's some pre, here's a pre, here's prima facie evidence, which I'm sure you're aware of, and I'm sure your listeners are aware of, but if they're not, I'll refresh their memory, that there was, there was almost $18 trillion of negative yielding debt in the world not too long ago, like a year ago, before March of 2022. $18 trillion of negative yielding debt. Now, before 2014, the thought that you could get paid to borrow money was anathema. It was, you know, in the twilight zone. That's how that's how much and how far interest rates were distorted. Let's talk about the real estate bubble. Switching to the real. This is the third, third leg of the triumvirate of bubbles. Home price to income ratios today are higher 
than they were at the peak in 2005. Mortgage servicing costs. So you look at the, the principal and interest in mortgage payments as a percentage of income are higher today than they were prior to the global financial crisis. Uh, I, and I think you had somebody named, I think his name was Gurley, G-E-R-L-Y, an excellent interview Nick Gurley, on your yeah. program, which will back up the data that I just said. Those are facts that I just, those two things I just said, home price to income ratios and the mortgage servicing costs are higher today than at any other time in history. Now, those are your three, that's the triumvirate of bubbles that I called. And there are ancillary bubbles out there also. There's bubbles in autos. There's bubbles in crypto. They're gonna, those are ancillary bubbles that will burst, but those are the three biggest bubbles. Now, if you don't mind, I'd like just like, I'll take a break there and I'll, before I get into the debt situation. Remember, it's, it's the distortion of money supply. It's the distortion of interest rates, which engendered asset bubbles. But when you distort money supply growth and you distort interest rate borrowing costs, to the tune where they're negative in nominal terms, that, that 17, 18 trillion was not in real terms, wasn't inflation adjusted, it was in nominal terms. You get people to do what, Adam? They borrow a tremendous amount of money. And I wanna go through that next, but I'm gonna pause to let you in for uh, any kind of questions you might have. Uh, I think I would get uh, strung up by Yardarm if I was accused of interrupting your momentum here, Michael. So go straight into the debt. We get it, okay. though. You, 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 you monkey around with uh, the supply of money, and they unleashed a tsunami of it. You monkey around with interest rates. They suppress them to, in certain cases, historic lows, like in all in recorded history lows. Asset bubbles, as a result, uh, ensue, no huge surprise. And as you said, people take uh, that basically free money that's sloshing around and doesn't cost you anything to borrow, and they go borrow like drunken sailors. So we follow that simple math. Yep, yeah, that's exactly right. And that also engenders inflation. So we'll get back to that in a second. So total non total non-financial debt currently is 263% of GDP. In 2007, it was 227% of GDP. Now, people say, well, Mr. Pento, that's it's all government debt, so it doesn't matter. Well, okay, let's say, it, first of all, it does matter because the government doesn't have any money. They have to issue debt, which takes money from the private sector. But why it, doesn't ma why it also matters is because people say, well, the, can't the government just print that away? They can monetize it away. I'll say, correct. But that's easy to do when you have decades of being below your asinine 2% inflation target. But it's very difficult to make that excuse, to have that argument by a central bank, a Federal Reserve that says, don't worry about the massive amount of government debt. That's, a, that's outstanding. That's why we have a, a leverage ratio much higher than it was prior to the global financial crisis. It's much easier to monetize the debt when you're 2% or below, but when you're just off of 9% inflation and your CPI is still 5% year over year, which is two and a half times the Fed's target, it's not so easy to have that argument. But non-financial business debt, I would go and say that it's just not government debt. Not that that doesn't matter. It does matter a whole heck of a lot. But non-financial business debt is now 75.8% of GDP. That figure was 68.7% of GDP just prior to the global financial crisis. So we have more business debt. We have more debt overall than we have prior to the global financial crisis. And this is why, Adam, people come to Wealthion to get this data, because you don't hear this on CNBC. What you hear ad nauseum is that there is no over-leveraged economy. There are no distortions in asset prices. And there, therefore, this recession is going to be what? It's going to be a soft landing. It might not happen at all. If one happens, it's going to be mild, blah, 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 blah. It's, 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 it's absolutely nauseating to hear that because when you actually go back on the Z.1, which is available for anybody to see, you know, I compiled this data prior to coming on the program, but anybody can look at a Z.1 and look at the total amount of debt outstanding as a percentage of the economy. Look at BEA.gov. It's not that hard. Nominal terms. We're all talking about nominal terms. Now, the IIF, the Institute for International Finance, put out a report recently. Global debt surged to $305 trillion. That is 45 
trillion dollars higher than it was pre-pandemic. I didn't say global financial crisis, Adam. I said pre-pandemic. That is 350% of global GDP, 25% higher than the pre-global financial crisis figure of 278% of GDP. So this is not a problem that is just US centric. It is throughout the developed world, $305 trillion, up 45 trillion since the pandemic and a much higher percentage of GDP. All right. Now, um, every se- this is IIF data. Every single sector of global debt as a percentage of GDP is higher today than in any other time. So you're talking about non-financial debt, business debt, government debt, private sector debt, all higher than they were in any other time in history globally. Okay. Right. And Mike, Mike, I just want to underscore, uh, interrupt to underscore one important point which you're making, which is it's not just that the debt levels are higher, it's that the percentage of debt levels are higher. So we are a more leveraged system at this point. And I am sure you're going to tie that in, at some point soon to interest rates, meaning that a more leveraged system is much more vulnerable to the impact of a rise in interest rates, which of course we've seen pretty violently occur over the past year. Well, it leads to, um, and look look at the studies done by Rog- uh, Rogoff and Reinhardt, um, it leads to a, a debt disabled economy. It leads to inflation being very high. It leads to very low levels of productivity and growth as well. Um, so uh, again, this is, this is a result of the greatest distortion of money supply growth and interest rates in history. So that led to a 40 year high in inflation. And um, so the central banks, when you when you have a two percent inflation target, and you're buying mortgage backed securities in the early part of 2022 to boost housing prices even higher and further away from, you know, <laughs> from the middle class, uh, and and engendering more and more inflation, and then you wake up sometime, you know, in you know March in 2022, he says, oh, all right, we're we're far behind the curve. Now we have to fight inflation. So. You know, you're not just fighting, you know, it wasn't 3% CPI trying to get to 2% CPI. It was 9% the way they calculated it, the way the Federal Reserve calculated it, and the way the BLS calculates it, the way the government calculates it. But if you look at all the private sources, it was between 17 and 20%, Adam. Yeah. So this was not a voluntary, you know, do-gooder by on the part of Powell say, you know what? I think I'm going to be nice to the middle class of the United States. And try to fight inflation because I just feel like I'm in a good mood today. This was a forced move. The the Fed had zero credibility after they said inflation was going to be transitory. And then they said, oh, okay, it's going to come back to 2% very quickly. And it never, you know, it's 5% in the middle of 2023. I think it comes down to three and a half, 4%, but it's going to be very, very difficult to get to 2%. And I'm going to explain why that is a little bit later on. But listen, The Fed funds rate was negative from 2008 to 2022, okay? 14 years worth of negative real borrowing costs. So if you you lower the rate of the Fed funds by inflation, if you reduce it by inflation, it was negative from all the way from 08 to 2022. Now today, the Fed funds rate for the first time since 2008, just broke above um, flat, broke above zero. We now have a real or a positive Fed funds rate. And that occurred with the hike in we, that we got in May. So with the effective Fed funds rate is 5.1%. And <laughs> CPI inflation is 5%, again, the way they measure it. Now, core is even higher, but let's just go with the headline, okay? Yeah. There's many ways of looking at inflation. But the fact is, that it, 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 it came from being minus 8%. The real Fed funds rate was negative 8%. So I look at things that are on a rate of change basis. When you go from minus 8% to a positive 0.1%, you say, oh, it's only 
you know, it's only positive by 0.1%. What do you want? It's the rate of change that matters. So when mm-hmm. you go from that, ne- you go from negative borrowing costs in real terms from 08 to 22, and then you go to a positive from a negative eight, it makes a hell, a hell of a lot of difference. Heck of a lot of difference. Now, 80% of so that we're, t- we're talking now about the tightening of monetary policies as a result of what I just went through, as a result of the inflation that was engendered by these asinine policies. So 80% of global central banks have raised interest rates recently. The US rates are now as high as they were in the global financial crisis. They, in the global financial crisis, so leading from, say, 2004 to 2006, interest rates were raised from 1% to five and a quarter. This time around, they went from zero to five and a quarter. But as I just mentioned, and we all, you don't need me to go through how much time we have left. We have, we have some time. Yeah, left. We got as much time as you need, Michael. Go we for don't it. need, you don't need me to go through what happened in the global financial crisis and the meltdown of the banking system globally. We have the same level today, but we got there faster. We got there in one year, not two years. And the level of debt outstanding is much greater. And the, the existence of asset bubbles is much greater. And these asset bubbles need constant fuel for them to, to increase. And you take away that fuel, and that is what we have done. We are in the process of doing that, and that's when things break, like four banks going out of business. And, and I want to jump ahead, but I can hear people saying, well, uh, well what? what's happening? How come the market's not melting down? I'm mm-hmm. going to explain what I, why I think um, the economy hasn't collapsed yet. But again, I'm going to pause for uh, any questions you might have. No, I mean, look, yeah, I, I think you're feeding the, the audience exactly what it wants. Uh, Pastor Pento is preaching to the choir here. I, I don't want to be guilty of interrupting him. Um, let, let, let's actually go to that point. And if you can, um, I've been talking about this a lot of late on the channel, which is um, liquidity. Um, yeah. Obviously, you know, we were shoving a ton of liquidity into the system during the pandemic. We we experienced the the twin monetary and fiscal cliffs that you talked about, where the spigots largely got turned off. Um, but but it seems like right now there's a lot of cross currents going on. Um, first off, uh, what I've been hearing about a lot recently from people is is um, this distortion is created by you know shoving a ton of liquidity into the system, and that we are still experiencing the pig through the python process where they're saying there was so much liquidity, the pig is still in the Python. Like it hasn't it hasn't fully exited yet. And, and that's supporting prices to a certain extent. Then there are, um, you know, other things that are supportive of liquidity. Um, there's the, uh, the the new term bank lending facilities that have been announced. It's, it's not QE, but but some argue that the market's treating it like it is. There are some central banks that are still easing, like Japan and China. We've had the China reopening uh, starting mm-hmm. around um, uh, October of last year or fall of last year. Um, uh, and so there's, you know, there, there are some that are saying, hey, that that's enough to actually be sort of a net liquidity positive move. And of course, there's other things going on in terms of, oh, and the TGA has been spending money by, by draining the TGA. That's, that's liquidity positive. Now that may flip to negative once the debt ceiling uh, is 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 raised, and that's going to start hoovering liquidity out. But at the same time, the Treasury will be able to start raising debt again for the Inflation Reduction Act, which will be putting stimulus back into the economy. So, so it's a confusing time to be understanding: is the tide rising or not? I know as we measure it by M two, it's going down, but there are these other things going on. So in your answer, if you can touch on liquidity as best you're able to measure it right now, I think folks would love to hear that. <laughs> well, you kind of just answered the, <laughs> you kind of just did it for me, but I, I put a, I'll put a couple of data points on that if you don't mind. Not um, at all. I'll put some data points on the, on the pig and the python. So the start of 2020, M2 money supply was $15.3 trillion. In March of 22, it shot up to $21.7 trillion. So from 15.3 to 21.7. That is a 
in 6.4 trillion dollar increase in the M2 money supply. That is a 42% increase in the M2 money supply in two years. That is absolutely unprecedented. And I believe that is keeping a lot of liquidity and gamblers hot and heavy in the stock market. 42% in two years. Now, the M2 money supply before the pandemic was growing at a rate of about 4% per annum. That was normal for it to increase 4% per annum. M2, not the base money supply, M2, broader, a broader aggregate. Um, but now it's shrinking. It shrank by over just over 4% year over year. So I look at things from a rate of change basis. So it is true that there's a lot of money out there that has to be absorbed yet. But we're on the way there. And that's that's the nexus between what I just said. So think about a lot of money supply, rate of change falling. So we're going from rapid inflation to disinflation, which is what I said would happen. It's happening. It's taking a long time to occur. But the model that I created, and I'm going to hopefully dive into that. I'm going to make sure we have a lot of time to dive into the model. Um, tells me that we're headed for a recession, still heading that way, that there. But it's just taking a lot of time to get there. Even more time than I honestly thought that it would take. But you look when you look at the data and the numbers behind the money supply growth, it's it's very clear why why it's happening. Now, in in March, uh, it, let me touch on some other things you mentioned. In March of twenty three, March of this year, the banking system started to to falter. Correct? We had four banks now. Four banks failed in total. Yeah, the, the the three of the four largest bank failures in U.S. history have happened in the past two months. Correct. Two, three, and four. Correct. So. Um, that caused the Fed to launch something called the Bank Term Funding Program. It, I call it QE Light. Danielle DiMartino Booth, who I respect greatly, I don't think she likes to call it Q, QE at all. Um, there are people who think it's just flat out QE. This is how I look at it. Before, before I go into that, let me just say it was $400 billion increase in the base money supply in two weeks, Adam. Mm -hmm. Two weeks. So for those who think that the Fed is like, you know, uh, Powell is the reincarnation, reincarnation of Paul Volcker, maybe they ought to think again. I mean, he printed, think about printing $400 billion in base money supply in two weeks. Now, it's not really, Q, I call it QE light because it's it's not QE. Because so in QE is when you, when the Fed prints money, they they put print credit, actually reserves, they give it to primary dealers. Primary dealers surrender their assets, mortgage-backed securities and treasuries. And the Fed says, take my reserves and go out and make loans and buy more debt, buy more bonds. Because you know what? You can do that and front run me because I'm going to come behind you and do the same darn thing again next month. You know, $85 billion a month is what we were doing right. in, in, the, in, the, in the, the shank of the QE, right? So- just QE light is a loan. Now it's a loan at par for one year with interest. So if I'm a distressed bank and I'm underwater on my treasuries, I can now present them to the Fed, not through the discount window. I could still use a discount window, but I prefer the BTFB if I was a bank. I get par, uh, you know, 100% of this asset, the, the reserves I will get for one year, but I have to pay about 4.7% interest on that. I think it's even a little higher than that now. So if I'm a bank that's you know, suffering th through a li illiquidity crisis, I'm probably not going to go out and make a lot of stupid loans <laughs> with my reserves that I know I have to send back to the Fed in a year with interest at par, because there's no guarantee that my note that I've given to the Fed is going to be worth par when I get it back. Right. So this is I, I think it's creating more like a zombie, a zombified banking system rather mm -hmm. than one that's going to go bonkers with QE. Um, so you have you have that you have that phenomenon, to, you know, four hundred billion dollars in two weeks, and you mentioned the TGA. So think of the TGA like a form of QE. It's it's reserves and cash that the Treasury uses to pay bills, and it sits at the Fed. It used to be about a half a trillion dollars. Now it's down to, I think some estimates are down as low as $60 billion. That's yeah. why we're supposed to default on default. You know, we'll talk about that too. 
on um, on June 1st. Um, but once the Treasury, once this deal gets done, and I think it will get done, but it's a lot harder this time. This time, Can I just touch on why it's going to be a lot harder this time? Just Absolutely. Briefly. Because we have people like Matt Gates in, in, in Congress. And you know, I happen to like the guy, so I'm not, I'm not saying that any, I'm not disparaging him in any way. But he, in other words, Congress passed a bill that they sent to the Senate and it never even got a vote, never went to the floor of the Senate. I'm not surprised. Um, but that bill was, hey, we'll, we will raise the debt ceiling if you do the following, which is dramatically and trenchantly cut spending. Now, when the deal gets done, and I think it will get done, but it's going to take a lot longer because McCarthy wants to hold the gavel, the Speaker of the House. If he goes and gets this deal done with mostly Democratic votes, he will lose his speakership. And of, of course, what do people want in Washington more than anything? Even more power. than making a deal. You know, they want power. Did you say that? Did I hear you say power? Yeah, power. Yeah. That's why you're a genius. That's why you run the most popular web program in, on, in <laughs> yeah. the planet. They want to hold on to power. So when the markets tell them, hey, 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 uh, hey jerks, we, it, we, need to, we need to find a settlement here because you know, stock prices are crashing and everybody's 401k is going into the, into the toilet, then they'll reach a decision. They'll, they'll meet, they'll, they'll agree. But it's going to take a lot longer because again, you have, you know, you have these MAGA Republicans in there who just don't want to deal at all. Some of them just won't raise a debt ceiling. I don't care what you do. We're at 32 trillion and we ain't going a dollar higher than that. But when the deal actually gets done, the TGA has to be refilled. And they do that by selling treasuries, taking those reserves and putting parking them at the Fed out of the banking system. That's that's going to be a significant tightening. So you have zombie banks and and a by the way, the Fed's balance sheet is now shrinking again. It, it went from eight. 8.3 trillion, almost back to 9 trillion, right? In a, in a matter of a couple of weeks, um, 8.7, 8.8 trillion. And now it's back to going, heading very quickly back to 8.3 trillion. I, I wouldn't be surprised if it was there by the end of this week. We get the data on that um, Thursday. Mm -hmm. So um, so we're now shrinking the, the base money supply. We're going to be refilling the TGA. And I think that's enough to bring the illiquidity scenario back to the four, and you're you're going to start to get more runs on banks. And I don't think I touched on this, Adam, and I do apologize for rambling as I tend to There's do. a lot to cover here. It's all good. The problem with banks was extent because banks can't make payments on their depositors, their demand deposits. They can't give them an interest rate that is equal to or greater than their assets, which are their loans. That's the primary issue here. So you go into a bank and the calculation is you go to your regional bank, your favorite one, and you say, hmm, I have an awful lot of money here, way above my uh, FDIC insured limit. And you know, you're giving me five basis points on my demand deposit. And even if I get a time deposit, you're talking about just a few, a few small hundreds of basis points. But alternatively, I could take my money and go to a money market fund and get 5% on a zero to three month T-bill. Let me see what I want to do. Yeah, I'll see you later. Right. And that's what's happening. The banks have no choice because if they raise their deposits to match their assets, they're in deep trouble. They're insolvent. But you know, QT is a removal of reserves from the banking system. I take my deposits out of my bank. It's a removal of deposits from the banking system. That's causing not only, you know, not only strains banks' balance sheets, but also further inhibits the amount of credit into the system, more monetary tightening. And I hasten to add, last thing I'll say before I let you back in, is that when they do agree on this debt deal, and I think they will after much duress, you are going to see a fiscal tightening on top of the monetary tightening. We haven't really had the fiscal tightening yet. We had a tangential fiscal tightening which was a second derivative play from getting over the COVID relief. Now we're going to see an actual reduction in year over year spending. Very possible to happen if we reach this deal, if and when we reach this deal. So you're going to have fiscal and monetary tightening. Okay. And, and let's dig into that for a second. So you expect the fiscal tightening to happen 
uh, why? Because uh, some may are, I mean, they may have to concede, right? So they, there might be spending concessions coming out of this deal. But like I said earlier, this deal will also theoretically allow them to start uh, funding the Inflation Reduction Act again, which yeah. will be putting money out there. So, well, right now uh, the money is coming out there. The money's coming from the TGA. So the, mo the money supply is increasing right now. Um, when they agree to the deal, see what was factored into GDP uh, forecasts and earnings growth forecasts was a resolution to the debt ceiling, an automatic resolution to the debt ceiling, where we would issue all the debt that was already promised by these contracts, these government right. contracts approved by Congress. Well, those contracts are going to be renegotiated and there's going to be a lot less debt issued. And we have a debt-based monetary system. So I believe it's going to be a fist, you know, on a rate of change basis, it'll be a fiscal tightening that will occur from what has been projected to be out there in 2023 and beyond. Okay, got <laughs> it. So, so, so forecasts will have to be brought down Obviously, that's going to impact markets that are currently priced to the status quo. Okay, right. totally makes sense. Um, all right, look, I, I I want to get to your model because I know that that's going to be the real interesting meat of this conversation, though it's been fascinating uh, already. <laughs> Hasn't there been are, interesting yet. <laughs> there are a couple of questions I need to ask you that you haven't ticked off yet. You did tick off liquidity. You did tick off debt ceiling. Um, I want to talk about inflation just real briefly, which you've mentioned. Um, I just want to underscore, sounds like what I heard you say is, yes, they've made progress with their efforts so far uh, in bringing it down from you know 9% headline CPI to 4.9 now, but it sounds like you think the, the road from here is going to be slower and harder in terms yeah. of getting inflation from where it is now down to sort of where the Fed is saying, hey, we're not stopping until we get to 2.5%. Um, just explain your reasons for why you think it's going to be sticky. And just so you know, this interview is, is being released the day after I had a, a long interview with Wolf Richter on this exact same topic, and he agrees with you. He talked a lot about the stickiness, particularly in the services side of the equation so far. Okay, so the, so the base effects over the next two months will bring inflation down to about three and a half to four percent, just because of the base effects of a year ago inflation readings. But from there, and I, I didn't hear your interview yet, but I assume he means wages. Wages are extremely sticky. And service sector inflation and rents are very sticky. So I, I I don't see inflation coming down much further than three and a half. In fact, there's a very good possibility that it will tick higher, closer to four, four and a half percent by the end of the year. And that is still twice as high of the, as the Fed's target. Okay. And is it is and is that that potential increase um uh or yeah, it, 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 I guess where I'm going with this is one of the things that's helping CPI come down right now has been the year over year comparisons, which are are more generous in terms of logging in a lower year over year increase. Right. But once we get through the second half of this year, that doesn't become as favorable. You're nodding as I'm exactly, saying. Exactly. Exactly correct. Base effects okay. are less favorable after the summer. Okay. All right. So we have we've got stickier uh, inflation ahead of us from here. Um, the Fed has been very, very clear that they're still gunning for 2%, that they are planning zero rate cuts this year, even though the market still thinks a little bit differently on that. Um, we had uh, Bullard from the Fed just out uh, earlier this week saying that he thinks, in fact, maybe two more hikes are necessary. Um, we also have the additional um, contractionary impact of tightening bank lending standards following this banking crisis that we've been talking about, right? And, and Chair Powell has said, hey, those actually act as additional rate hikes. Um, so in, in the mix of that context, what do you expect Fed policy to be here when inflation is going to be sticky? As far as we can tell in the data right now, the employment sector is really hanging in there, so they don't have to worry about that part of their mandate right now. Do you see them as surprising markets by being higher -er for longer -er than the markets currently priced in? Or do you think something's going to break and force their hand? What, what, what are you projecting? Okay. The best way I can answer this, and just allow me just a little bit of slack when I answer this. Sure. The, the, let's, banks are tightening lending standards, and the Fed has avowed, they have averred, better word, that they, are, they will let the tightening in, lend, in lending standards supplant their rate hikes. So I don't see the Fed hiking rates again this year. In fact, I still predict that 
there's a very high likelihood that they could be cutting rates by the end of this year. Okay. Now let's just and, and here's why here's why I say and I and I say that the remember I just said that inflation could go higher. So then why it sounds contradictory because of what's happening in the banking system, and that's why I have a model because I don't sit here and predict what's going to happen in October and then stick to it no matter what. Mm-hmm. But I'm I'm watching the dynamics in the in the banking sector, and and let me just say this one fact and get this out. The 30-year fixed mortgage rate has been below the current T-bill rate since 2010. I, I, I want to say that again and, and let that sink in. And, and why, why is that important? So, and I, I said this now. earlier. <laughs> say, say again? I, I, I said, because it's not now, right? It, it, no, the, 30, the 30-year fixed mortgage rate the 30 year fixed mortgage is not no now it's 7%. It's exactly. Back seven, it's back to 7. Right. But it's been it's been below that since 2010. Right. So, so very So recently, things are different right now. Yeah, exactly. Things are very different right now. But the point why I'm trying to make is that all those loans, commercial real estate loans and mortgages made, which is a very big part especially of the regional banking uh sector. All those loans, those that income is less than the T bill rate. Uh, which is about 5.1. You get a 5.5 too, uh, a couple of days ago, last time I looked on um, very short duration T-bills. So that's going to perpetuate this bank run. I think Bianco calls it, uh, Jim Bianco calls it a bank walk. <laughs> but money is, le- deposits are leaving. And I believe, and Janet Yellen av- averred this uh, as well, that there's going to be more, you know, it's a euphemism. There's going to be more bank mergers yeah. yeah, consolidations, which is can a I, white I, word for failures. Yeah, <laughs> right. That's a, that's a euphemism for bank failures. Yeah, and that's why because they just can't ever raise their deposit rate to match their income they receive on their assets. So I predict if that intensifies and we see a plethora, not just four, but a lot of these regional banks going under, that's going to exacerbate and expedite the disinflation morphing to deflation despite base effects, despite higher wages, because people will be getting fired and won't have a job. That's a very high likelihood to happen. And then the Fed will be cutting rates, not raising them later this year. So watch out for that. Okay. Um, So uh, kind of a related question then. So, um, it sounds like you're sort of in the camp of something's going to break here, you know, at the current tra- the, the current policy trajectory, right? Um, it sounds like you think the banking system is, you know, vulnerable to to more failures from here that might cause the Fed to have to rescue with with a rate cut or or, or more. Maybe we'll see. Um, do you have concerns about other things breaking? I mean, just I just want to I want to talk to Michael Pento from. 15 months ago. And I say, hey, Michael, in the next 15 months, the Fed's going to take the federal funds rate from <laughs> where it is today to five and a quarter, and who knows, maybe even higher. <laughs> um, do you think the economy can can sustain a cost of capital that that, that, that high? Or, you know, with, with, with the you of, of 15 months ago have said, geez, you know, the zombie companies are going to die and, you know, we're going to have... Yeah, it's stress in the banking system, but we're probably going to have stress in some of these other areas too. And the consumer is going to start breaking. Um, you know, can could, can we follow <laughs> Powell's plan of longer for higher here, or do you really think, in addition to banks, we may have some other big breakages at these these high we rates? Haven't seen, we haven't seen anything yet in the commercial real estate front that's going to break. The auto loans are very fragile. Um, collateralized loan obligations, the whole entire shadow banking systems on thin thin ice, private equity, pension plans. All those things are going to be in extreme pressure. And we haven't seen it yet. Adam, you said it yourself, 15 months. Monetary tightening or easing works with a long and variable lag between 12 and 18 months. That's the usual time frame. Well, we're not even close to 18 months yet. I mean, we're just approaching that time frame yet. So we haven't even seen the first rate hike yet really hit the, you know, maybe the first couple when it was went from zero to, you know, 75 beeps, but we have yet, 
let me just re reinforce this one fact fact in in the global financial crisis the fed stopped hiking at five and a quarter percent in the summer of 2006 was that a good time i mean turn off cnds for a second and think for yourself was the last time the fed stopped hiking a great time to go long the stock market no because a year later we started to have bear stearns uh hedge funds that were real estate related break. That's when the market topped out. A year after that, everything fell apart. The whole global financial system fell apart. Well, again, we don't have to probably wait a year or two. I mean, it's possible we have to wait a year, but I think it's highly unlikely, highly improbable to wait that long because of the, the rate of change of interest rates is twice as fast. We are also doing QT at this time draining reserves, and the level of debt extent in the system is much greater. That pulls forward that entire timeline. But all the things I just mentioned are all on the come. Okay. Because of the delayed aspects of monetary tightening. Okay. And the lag effect, which, which we've talked about a lot on this channel, but we really haven't talked about it that much in the past couple of weeks. So I'm glad you're bringing it, bringing it back to the forefront here. And so if I understand you correctly, you're saying, hey, look, Forget just about the current snapshot of how things are doing. We have these shock waves that are, are traveling through time from when the Fed pulled those levers last year. They're going to start slamming into the economy, you know, again and again and again over the coming quarters. Um, so this goes to one of my next and one of my last questions before we get to your model, which is your outlook for recession. I, I find it hard to to hear everything you're wrapping up here saying without coming to the conclusion that you probably think there's a pretty nasty recession awaiting us here in the future, maybe later this year, maybe early next year. Drew? That's hundred percent accurate. I have not changed or deviated from that. My model will give me the timing. I'm going to get into that in a minute. It, right now, the model is still saying we are in a disinflationary environment and we're all, it's all clear that to me, when I'll go through the, I'm going to, I have a 20 point model, but I picked out uh, four um, components of it just to show your audience why I why I'm arguing for disinflation and a slowdown in growth, which should re lead to a negative nominal print for Q2 and Q3 and Q4 of this year, a a, a NBER official recession, um, and a significant fall in the averages still in the cards. And I'm gonna the model is very clear. That's exactly where we're headed. I'm just going to give you four when you, whenever you're ready. All right. Well, look, that is the perfect segue into talking about your model, which we've been teasing the whole time here. So let me bring up on my screen here uh, the, the four components you're going to share with us, and then we'll just let you run, Michael. So after being in the business for 32 years, um, it took me decades to actually officially launch this Inflation deflation economic cycle model has been rigorously back tested to look at the 20 most salient components to let me know where the economy is headed on a second derivative basis of inflation and growth. So I just decided to you know to share four of these indicators with you um, today. So the first one is the 10 year break even inflation rate, which is basically the market's opinion of where inflation is going to be 10 years out. And if you see during times of uh, recessions, you see a precipitous decline in the perceived rate of inflation. So leading up to the great financial crisis, the global financial crisis, it went from 2% all the way down almost to 0%, 0 inflation, which means that the basically that's saying that you're paying the same for a inflation index bond as you would for a nominal bond. And that this is telling me very clearly, if you look to the, clearly, look at to the right of the chart, that we've been in a disinflationary environment, coincidentally, since the Fed started raising interest rates. So the market is anticipating that inflation is going to be falling over the duration of the next 10 years, five years, five years forward. That's 10 year inflation rate. So um, we've gone from uh, two point, I believe that says 3% all the way down to almost two and a half percent, two point. The current uh, statistic is 2.26% to be specific. So this is comment Terry on disinflation which is going to lead to deflation that's happens every time 
you have a recession, you see clearly uh, denoted in the gray shaded areas. So the model predicts disinflation will morph into deflation and recession in the very near future. But I'm waiting for this particular indicator to gap. And that will let me know when it's time to increase shorts in the portfolio. Normally, there will be a gap before um, you enter into the meat and the, and the, and the uh, nucleus of a recession. And that will inform me when to increase the shorts in the portfolio. Now, the second chart, courtesy of Trading Economics, is the NFIB, National Federation of Independent Businesses, Small Business Optimism Index. This is a, crit a critical chart. Oh, again, these charts have been, and these data points have been rigor rigorously backtested for the most important indicators to let me know where the economy is headed on a second derivative basis as far as inflation and growth is concerned. And you look what happened in 2005. You see this chart very clearly falling, indicating a lack of optimism in the small business arena, which is a very critical part of the economy. And the same thing has happened here. You see this a chart, uh, actually the, the optimism peak rate, basically in 2018, 2019. And it has 2020, it fell off, the, fell off the cliff. It rebounded, but it's right down here, very crit crit uh, critical level pointing towards disinflation and recession. The timing for when we get more short will be when we see a pre precipitous drop in these charts. And they're all saying to me clearly, and I look, I, I'm not going to divulge exactly the math behind it, but I look at the rate of change of the rate of change in these charts. They're all saying to me, we're headed much lower. The fourth, the, the third chart is the net percentage of domestic banks tightening standards for commercial industrial loans. You see where we are today, it's 46%, which is a slight tick up from the previous reading. But in in every other metric, you see back all the way here in um, uh, 1980, and then in 2000, and then the global financial crisis, we're just approaching the level now that has occurred before we enter into an official recession. So I would not be surprised. The next reading is significantly tighter than 46%. This is net percentage of banks tightening lender standards, okay? As that percentage increases, the rate of change increases, look for the economy to falter from disinflation to, dis to deflation and, re and recession. And then the final chart here is the effective Fed funds rate adjusted for consumer price inflation. And you can see what I talked about in the presentation back in 2022, we actually had a negative 8% real Fed funds rate. And you see the, la the last time the Fed wow. funds rate, the last time the Fed funds rate went positive was in 2019. And I just remind your audience in 2019, what happened? We had a repo market crisis the fed had to come in and lower interest rates dramatically and um significantly and that was before the outbreak in, Co in COVID. remember the outbreak in COVID was in uh, the early part of 2022 so we're now positive the rate of change has been you know extraordinary i'm looking for this effective fed funds rate to rise up to about one to two percent and that will inform me that the level of real borrowing costs in the intra-bank lending uh, arena has risen to a rate that's going to cause a significant tightening in lending standards and will engender that m transition from disinflation to deflation and from a slowdown in growth to an outright recession. So now turn, so those are four um, uh, very significant components to my model. They're not, there's 16 others that I use. I just wanted to share those with you. But I want to turn now to the uh, spectrum that I, uh, that I use. This is the inflation deflation economic cycle investment spectrum. So every one of those components gets assigned a value. It's proprietary, but just to let you know what's going on, is that that value is, is range between, ranges between zero and 100. And there's five sectors that you can invest in, in this spectrum. Number, sector one is one of deflation. Sector two is when inflation is decelerating, that's disinflation. Sector three is a stasis or inflation being stable on a rate of change basis. Sector four is when inflation is accelerating. And then sector five, think of stagflation or tractable inflation is when you have very high rates of inflation, but no growth in the economy. And every single sector 
has its own particular asset classes that will outperform. So you think about in sector one, when you're in deflation, you want to overweight, overweight T-bills. You want to have some shorts in the portfolio. You want to be long the US dollar. Again, all of these components are rigorously back-tested. You want to be long the dollar. Um, and here's the, you know, the, the, um, the ETFs that match the, in the palette of investing for each sector. Um, and this is you know, pretty, ex, pretty much explanatory. And you can share that with the audience. I don't mind sharing that with, with them because you know, I, I, I think that people need to have uh, a better model and a better way of analyzing the stock market and the data other than their feelings or moving averages. So if you if you look at the 20 components of my model, you only got four of them. If you come and, and join my firm, you'll get you'll get me managing according to all 20 of them. But all 20 of those components, every single one of those components, scream and shout the same thing. We are in a disinflationary environment. We are in a, a rate of change, deceleration and growth, and clearly heading towards deflation and recession. That's sector one. And that's those are the um those are the clear, rigorously backtested investment asset classes and ETFs. Um, you know that you want to own in in each sector. Wow, Michael, I just want to thank you on behalf of all the viewers here. This is an incredibly useful, valuable, and generous amount of detail. Uh, this is kind of like the holy grail for what you want, you know, an expert to share when he comes on this channel. So I just, again, want, want to thank you so much for preparing this and, and being willing to open the kimono so uh, so fully for everybody here. It's it's just highly, highly valuable and appreciated. Um, well, you know, Adam, in the end of the day, you know, it's all about, you know, what you what we're here on this earth. We want to help people as much as we can. I mean, we're not here to be selfish individuals. We want to and especially people, you know, your audience. This is for your audience alone. I don't, I don't, I don't publish this out for everybody. Um, I want your audience to be aware of what's going on and protect themselves because we're dealing with people's retirement and their lifestyle and their and their and their and their financial happiness, financial success. So, you know, the more people become aware of what works and what doesn't, the better they'll be able to survive the coming chaos. Well, uh, just. Huge gratitude and kudos to you for that, Michael. Not every not every advisor is wired that way, and you're one of the great ones. Um, quick question about this chart before we move off it. Um, I, I presume, given how you've described how you see the current scenario, that you are largely still positioned in sector two. We're going to talk about the your market outlook and your specific positioning in a minute. But but are we in sector two right now on our way to sector one? Okay, we are we are in the middle of sector two and one. We're in sector two, heading to sector one is exactly correct what you just stated. I now that doesn't mean you can't have pieces of sector one because we've been long the for instance we've been long the U.S. dollar for a very long time and correctly so. We sold half of our position a few months ago, but we can take that position back up. But there there are times where you can have pieces of each sector. But the clear evidence is that we are in, you're exactly correct. We're in sector two, heading for sector one. Okay, great. Well, all right, Michael, um, this has been a great discussion so far. And now we are getting to the main event where um, we want to talk about where you see things headed market-wise and how your model is encouraging you to position um, given all the indicators that, that, you know, what they're telling you right now in real time. Um, you said that you expect to see a recession uh, either in the second half of this year, or beginning of next year. I presume that means uh, along with that, that would be commensurate with some sort of market correction. I don't want to put words in your mouth. And what you're telling me, I've got the impression it's probably going to be a pretty material correction, but you tell us. Yeah, I mean, I haven't, I haven't deviated from my um, target here. Our interview with Michael will continue over in part two, which will be released on this channel tomorrow as soon as we're finished editing it. To be notified when it comes out, subscribe to this channel if you haven't already by clicking on the subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. And be sure to hit the like button too while you're down there. And finally, 
If the challenges that Michael has detailed in this interview have you feeling a little vulnerable about the prospects for your wealth, then consider scheduling a free, no strings attached portfolio review by a financial advisor who can help manage your wealth, keeping in mind the trends, risks, and opportunities Michael's mentioned here. Just go to Wealthion.com and we'll help set one up for you. Okay, I'll see you next over in part two of our interview with Michael Pinto. Thank you.